Our next speaker is uh, Robert Mulvani from the International Partnership in Ice Core Sciences. Thank you. OK, I'm from the British Antarctic Survey, but I'm giving this talk in a way this morning um, as a community effort from the International Partnerships of Ice Core Sciences. And I'll try and tell you, first of all, what I mean by that. Uh, we had a meeting earlier this week uh, in Corvallis. This is a community that's got together to try to think about where ice core sciences are going to go over the next five to 15 years or so. We've been really successful in the past couple of decades with the greenhouse gas records from uh, Antarctica and Greenland and the very long records from places like the like Dome C. But where are we going to go for the next 10 to 15 years? And this is, we've come up with four major projects. The first of these, probably the most challenging, the old, a search for the oldest ice core on Earth, somewhere in central Antarctica. We hope we may be able to get back as far as 1.5 million years. The previous interglacial in Greenland, we don't yet have a, an interglacial from Greenland, and there is a project underway right now uh, called NEEM, uh, which hopes to it's found a site where we will get back to the previous interglacial. And then at the bottom, the two slightly smaller projects, are a network of 40,000-year cores, and then a, a, a much larger, probably much larger network of 2,000 year cores and this is where we expect we will be going in the next uh, as I say in the next decade or so so it's, it's quite helpful then to, to, to look to, well it's quite good then to have been invited to give this talk this morning on the 40,000 year record because it's, it's quite relevant to where we are expecting to go over the next few years. This is the to map of Antarctica and Greenland all I'm trying to show there is in dots some of the cores we already have and in the circles, some of the areas where we think it might be good to get cores at some point uh, over the next few years. I don't really want to labour that too much. Uh, what I want to show first, though, is, is this diagram. This is a, the, why did we choose 40,000 years? What was so special about 40,000 years? Here's the, the deep ice cores from central Antarctica. Of course, places like Dome Sea go back 800,000 years. But what you're looking at there is the, the, la the previous glacial cycle, which is quite well defined in all of these four central Greenland cores. And the 40,000 year record really starts somewhere here where we've got the last of the Antarctic warming events, the interstadial warming events, the transition through and then the Holocene. So we've really chosen this area here. And the reason for choosing that is there are many more sites already drilled in Antarctica that give records over that period. And also it's somewhere that you can drill records with not such a big effort as it took to make these deep records. So that's the, the, the reason for doing the, the 40,000 year um, network. What you're looking at now is a diagram showing existing cores, or at least existing cores, if they're existing cores that are analysed, if they're in bold like this, and then if they're in italics, cores that are currently being drilled. Taylor Stone finished last year, James Ross finished last year, and then Waste Divide is the new big American drilling project in, in, in West Antarctica. In brackets, I've given the, the, the records that are, don't span the full 40,000 years, but they all span at least the, the Holocene. So you can see we've got a fairly good array of cores crossing most of Antarctica, but there are still areas where there's very little available uh, ice, uh, climate records. Why, were the, why did the cores appear in those positions? I think it's probably worth looking at this diagram just to see why the cores appear in that diagram in those positions. All of those cores are drilled on ice domes or ice divides. The reason we do this is because we don't want to drill too co close to the coast because if we drill over here, say for example, the ice has steadily flowed from further inland and it distorts our climate record. So we don't get a good climate record, we get more of a, a flow record. So most of the cores have been drilled on these central regions of ridges or domes where the flow is extremely low. This is probably the best product in a way of, the, of, of, of this type of array. It's a little bit longer than 40,000 years, it's 60,000 years, but this is the, the Epica paper from Nature a few years back. And what it's shown you there is the bipolar seesaw. It's showing you the record comparing Greenland core here in black with two, three, sorry, Antarctic cores, the two Epica cores in Dronny Mordland and in Dome C, and the very old bird core from the, the, the early 60s. And what you can see in all of those cores, they've been, they've been, uh, the time has been um, tied by using the methane record. You can see that wherever you get Antarctica... Sorry, can nobody hear me? I've got halfway through my talk and nobody's heard a thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
The rest, the, the earlier bit was preamble. I can hear myself now. <laughs> okay. You don't need to know what I've said before. <laughs> it was preamble. What you, what you can see is in each of these warming events, events in Antarctica, Antarctica warms, and just as it reaches its, the, its height of its warmth and starts to cool again, that's when Greenland switches in and starts to warm. So there's this antiphase relationship between Greenland and Antarctica. That's the, the bipolar seesaw. I don't really want to say any more about that because what I want to do, I think this is diagrams very well, been very well uh, published. Uh, lots of people quote it. So what I want to do instead is look at the other cores we've got and see if I can derive something from, from them. Here is a Holocene record. This is a record spanning the last 12,000 years. And this is all of those cores I showed on the map, all of the ones that at least span the Holocene. I've plotted it like this. You can't really see trends, but I'm going to show you what the trends are in a moment. But I wanted to plot it like this because I wanted to show you that we really do span a very wide range of climate regimes. So we span all the way from Law Dome at a temperature of minus 22 down to Vostok at a temperature of minus 57. I think you can probably make out that most of them have a climate optimum somewhere around the beginning of the Holocene, a little bit earlier than the climate optimum you see at North Grip in Greenland but there is one core in there that appears to be warming all the way through the Holocene, and I'll come back to that one in a moment. So just as, re just as a reminder, the site temperature is very, very similar to... Oh, sorry, the trend in the site temperature, this is the spatial gradient between site temperature and deuterium. So the deuterium, about 10 parts per thousand in deuterium, is about one and a half Celsius. Not all of these records are published in deuterium. I've taken them all off uh, open databases. Many of them are published in oxygen 18, but I've converted to, to deuterium just to make life easier for me when I'm plotting the cores here. If you take those cores and then Valerie Masson a few years ago did this rather nice um, single spectrum analysis of the, core, of, the, of the various records. And what she found is if you take the Ross Sea sector, the cores around the Ross Sea, they have this general cooling trend all the way through the Holocene of about two or three Celsius. They've got an optimum round about the start of the Holocene and a secondary optimum around about 6,000 years. If you look at East Antarctic cores, again, you see a cooling trend, but perhaps not quite so strong. And again, the climate optimum somewhere around about the beginning of the Holocene. The bird core is somewhat different as it warms all the way through the Holocene, and I'll come back to that because this is another of those cores that seem to be warming through the Holocene rather than following the general trend of apparently cooling. If you take away the trend and look at what's left, this is the, uh, the, second, the second part of singular spectrum analysis, you can see that there are a number of aperiodic millennial scale oscillations in all of the cores and they are on a, a, about a, a pacing of about 800 to 1,200 years. So that's what the Holocene looks like in all of that array, of course. What I want to look at now is the deglaciation record. So here's a deglaciation record of all of the cores, not all of the ones that you saw on the map make it through into the, into the, into the pre-Holocene, so into the transition. So there's a couple of cores here, for example, that don't make it very far back into the transition. But nevertheless, we have got quite a lot of records that span this 40,000-year uh, period. The, th the four East Antarctic records are all very similar, so I'm, not going to, I'm going to sort of ignore those in a way and just keep one of them, Johnny Maudland, just for simplicity. But you can see that there's very similar, uh, very similar mechanisms taking place in all of the East Antarctic cores. But you can see there's quite a lot of different signal taking place in these non-East Antarctic cores. What I've done now is I've just uh, taken some averages, 200-year bins. I've brought it all the way through into the Holocene. I think what you can see is that here's the Ronnie Mordland core. Here's the transition here. All of the cores seem to show these millennial-scale oscillations. You can see it there in Seipel Dome. You can see it in Bird in the background. You can see it in Berkner. And then these are the Danskard Erschke events in Greenland. They all seem to show uh, uh, an Antarctic cold reversal at around about this point here. And then they all mostly cool, mostly cool through the Holocene, except for Bird and this, this record here from Burton Island, which has got this very, very strong warming, apparent warming all the way through the transition and all the way through the Holocene. So why is that? Well, firstly, the, the, the ones that are generally cooling tend to be East Antarctic cores or East Antarctic coastal cores. The cores that are warming through the Holocene tend to be from the West Antarctic ice sheet or this, this site out here, Burton Island. Why is that? Well, it's actually, it's actually all to do with the elevation of the, of the ice sheet. This is a model from Philippe Hoibrex showing the, 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 the build-up of the Antarctic ice sheet. 
starting back in the Eemian at 120,000 years when the sea level was slightly higher than today. And then you see, as you go through, you get to the last glacial maximum where the sea level is a, from the, the, the contribution to sea level from Antarctica is about 20 metres. And then as it warms, it starts to warm and you come all the way through. Even at 4,000 years, we're still losing mass from the West Antarctic ice sheet till you get to today. But looking through all that record, it looks like the East Antarctic ice sheet doesn't really vary all that much. So most of the action, if you like, is going on in West Antarctica. So I've gone back to this record again now, and what I want to remind you is that the, the, the deuterium excess, sorry, the deuterium record tells us about site temperature, but in fact it also in a way can tell us about site altitude. All I've done here is plotted the altitude of all of these sites with a deuterium record, and what that's all that's really is a consequence of the lapse rate, the, the, the change in temperature with altitude, so you do get a, a relationship between altitude and deuterium. But we can use that to try to look at what is happening in, in one of those records. I picked this rec record out in red from Birkner Island because it's by far the most, um, the, the biggest change from going from the, the glacial to the interglacial that you see in any of the cores. Why is that? I think this is probably telling you entirely, well, telling you a lot about the change in the elevation of the, of the ice sheet. What I've done here is I've taken the Dronny Maudland core as a reference climate signal, and then I've subtracted from this Birkner record, this record, and I've called everything that's left not a climate signal, but a change in elevation. The reason for doing that is Dronny Mordland is relatively close to Birkner Island. They don't, they're both facing the Atlantic Ocean. They're both likely to have suffered a, a similar climate history. The difference is the change in the altitude at this, it's this site, Birkner Island. So when, I've done, when I do that and use a, a lapse rate, this, this curve here with the scale on the right-hand side is my ice sheet elevation starting about 55,000 years BC, sorry, before present, and then rising all the way through to a, a point about 15,000 years, then, when it, then it rapidly thins to about 4,000 years before present. There's another way of doing, of looking at the altitude, which is to look at the total air volume in the, in the core. The air volume is related to the, the barometric pressure, which is related to altitude. And if you measure the air volume, then the, the values back here and the values here indicate a change in altitude of around about 600 metres, which is very similar to what we got in this diagram here of about 600 metres. I just want to show this. It's not really a paleoclimate, but I think it's actually quite helpful because it, if you looked at the, the, the record from the, the Burton Accord, it looks like the, 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 the elevation stopped changing about 4,000 years ago. Now, this is, a, this is a radar profile through the ice sheet. Here's the bed of the ice sheet here. And what you're looking at are these internal reflecting horizons. And what you can see is this little bump in the middle. I've lost it there, a little bump there. This is called a Raymond bump. And it only forms when the, the, the dome or the, or, the, or the ice divide is fairly stable, when it's not moving. And what's happening is you get a plug of stiff ice and the ice either side flows away. And what we can do is we can look at the amplitude of the bump versus the elevation above the bed and then model from that how long the, 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 the ice divide has remained stable and in that position. And if you do that, then if it had been there forever, you'd get, we seem to have lost this, you'd get the saturated curve here. This is what the bump amplitude versus height above bed would look like if the, if that, if the ice divide had been there for many, many thousands of years. What we get is this amplitude here. And that's, it's the best fit through that suggests that the, it re attained its current location about 4,000 years ago. So in other words, the, the ice divide has been stable for about 4,000 years. So similar to what you got from the, the, the ice core record. I'm going to look at another record here. This is from Taylor Dome. Um, there's a couple of interesting... Sorry, this is from Seipel Dome by Ken Taylor. And what this, this one shows... Is, as I'm going to show you in a moment, there's also a, 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 a change in elevation at this site as you go through the Holocene, but it's also got this odd step function somewhere around and back at 22,000 years. This also must be due to change in the elevation or the dynamics of the ice sheet or a very rapid change in accumulation. I don't think yet um, the group looking at this core really can explain this rapid step change in the in, in the, the isotope profile. But if I just go to what they do and feel, feel they understand, which is what the, the change in the elevation of the ice sheet at this Seipel Dome site looks like and the timing of it. What they've got here on the left is the ice equivalent accumulation over the last 25,000 years or so. And what they've done is modelled from that the altitude of the ice sheet. Again, I've lost it. Now I've blinded myself. 
and this, this is their model of what the ice sheet elevation should have, have done. It should have dropped right, by between 200 and 400 metres, starting at about 15,000 years. So again, similar, similar to what I showed you in the, the Weddell Sea core, the, around about 15,000 years, the ice sheet started to change in elevation. Why am I stressing this change in elevation? I think the reason for doing this is because, of course, the, the excitement, or not the excitement, but one of the issues, the, the issues in glaciology at the moment is the stability of the West Antarctic ice sheet. This is data from satellite altimetry, which shows the change in the surface elevation in over a four-year period, and you can see that in lots of the coastal West Antarctic ice sheet, the ice sheet is thinning quite rapidly, probably over a metre a year. So I think it, one of the things that we can do from our paleoclimate studies is try to understand the change in the, the, or the, the, the change in the, the elevation of the of West Antarctic ice sheet as a response to climate forcing to try to, to set in context what is happening at the moment and to give some credibility, I suppose, to the models of what might happen to the West Antarctic ice sheet over the next 100 years. So that was my reason for stressing that particular aspect of, of, the, of the climate records. So intriguingly, I, I guess I ought to answer this because some people do ask it, was that the origin, this rapid thinning of, in the ice sheet over the Weddell Sea, is that the origin of Meltwater Pulse 1A? Here's Meltwater Pulse 1A, around about 15,000 years. It's, there's a, a rapid change in the sea level of about 20 metres, which coincides almost perfectly with the start of the change in the elevation at this site and also the start of the change in the elevation at Seipel Dome. However, I don't think it's the, the whole story, because if you look at, go back to Philip Hoybrecht's model, the whole of the Antarctic is only equivalent to 20 metres of sea level, and he reckons that somewhere locked up in this region here is only equivalent to about 6 metres of sea level. So all the t although the timing is correct, the amplitude of the change in, in, the, in the sea level is, is, can't really be attributed to this, this West Antarctic ice sheet alone, I don't think. Yeah, I'm just about done, thanks. So I've just finally just go back now, just a little, just touch again on the on the deglaciation and the timing of the onset of the deglaciation. I brought this one up again um, because I think it shows you, if you look carefully, that it apparently the timing in different cores seems to the onset of the of the deglaciation seems to start at different times in different cores. So at the bottom we've got the, the Dronny Mordland core with the the onset starting around about 18,000 years. Similar onset in Law Dome, probably similar onset at Berkner Island. But Bird seems to have started a little bit earlier, and perhaps Taylor Dome started a little bit later. And in fact, Taylor Dome on this diagram seems to look very, very similar to, to North Grip, the Greenland core. I'd just make a comment on, on, on the dating through these sections. I'm not going to disagree with everybody's dating, but I would show you the difficulty we have dating through this particular section where the onset of the deglaciation takes place. Most ice cores nowadays are... Um, synchronize you are using the methane measured in the core and that's what you see at the top you see um, a, a, a Greenland ice core and two Antarctic ice cores the rapid changes in methane are used to synchronize the cores but you do need to know the change the, the di difference in delta age between the age of the air locked in the ice and the age of the ice around the air and that's sometimes quite difficult to, to, to obtain particularly when the, the accumulation is increasing rapidly. And what we've got is very, very few tie points through this period here, so very few tie points through exactly the point where the deglaciation starts, and then through the deglaciation, as soon as you get this rapidly changing accumulation, it's quite difficult to calculate the delta age. So I don't say that all those, um, those time scales are, are wrong, but you just have to be a little bit careful uh, with time scales through this period, and I think that's one of the challenges that we expect to, to have to face over the next few years as we, we look again at these cores and also look at again at, look at some of the new cores that we, we're beginning to collect. And here, for example, is one of the new cores. This is a, from Taylor Stone. This Massimo Frazzotti gave me this one, but there is a, a poster outside looking at this one, and you can see that the Taylor Stone, sorry, the ta Taylor Stone core here, which is down here, quite close to the Taylor Dome core, seems to display quite a different um, change in the in the uh, so quite a different pattern through the onset of, of deglaciation. Eric Steig, who produced this diagram originally, 
does warn, though, that what we have to be very careful of is not trying to match all Antarctic coastal cores with central, uh, uh, central Antarctic cores, because if we do that, then what we might be doing is missing the local regional signal. And I have to agree with him entirely on that one. It, it would be wrong to look at every core that doesn't look say, the same as Dome C and say it must be incorrectly dated. That certainly would be the wrong conclusion to, to draw from what I'm saying. So in summary, I've tried to show you the existing cores that, that, uh, that are available. I've shown you the climate oscillations related to Greenland, the, sea, the, the bipolar seesaw. I showed you a little bit about the, 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 the Holocene with its climate optimum at around 11,000 years and this, the millennial scale oscillations. I showed you that the, the Antarctic cores are largely similar whereas the West Antarctic ice, uh, ice sheet cores seem to show quite markedly different climate records, and I think a lot of that may well be related to the, to the uh, drawdown of the West Antarctic ice sheet through the, the, the deglaciation and the Holocene. And I would point out right at the end that there are still possibly still dating issues, so if you do choose a, an Antarctic climate core, and ice core, sorry, an, an Antarctic... If you do choose an ice core as your reference for Antarctic climate, take care, a little bit of care, which one you choose. Thank you. We have time for one question. There. Pierre. There. I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say that any of, any of them are not correct, but I think if I was going to use a reference core, I would probably use one of the, the Epica cores. I think they're probably the best dated cores, so either the Dronimordland or the Dome C core. But then again, I am from the Epica community, so I would say that. 